Okay, perfect. So, uh, I'm sorry, we were trying to get a third live case together for this morning, and uh, a number of different obstacles are likely going to prevent that from happening. So, I'm going to give my lecture on the Venovo stent, which was the stent we put in the previous case. Uh, I'm going to probably show you guys the case presentation of the, of the case that we're going to do probably off camera, and we can sort of talk about a treatment strategy, and maybe we'll show the results tomorrow morning. So uh, just to start, I'm going to uh, go through the Venovo clinical trial results. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide, please. So uh, I think the previous speaker touched upon a lot of ideal characteristics that we're looking for for venous stents. A number of these were discussed in the previous session. We want a accurate deployment mechanism. It, it really needs to have radiopaque markers. It shouldn't foreshorten. We want long lengths. And uh, again, I think one of the amazing things about the previous case was that we were able to treat that entire length down to the common femoral vein with a single length stent. And we obviously want high radial force and it to be resistant to compression. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Venovo stent is a stent that was uh, essentially um, engineered in-house by uh, Bard Vascular, um, and it's undergone uh, a very, very rigorous uh, sort of preclinical fatigue testing model. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, again, the, the level of durability, preclinical work with, with, with animals, flexibility testing, accuracy of deployment testing has been uh, extremely robust. Next slide, please. Um, compared to other devices that are not commercially available in the U.S. currently, this implant favors particularly well with regards to um, engineering characteristics of resistive force and crush resistance. Next slide, please. It is highly flexible and, again, favors very, very well as compared to these stents that are uh, at present not commercially available in the U.S. Next slide, please. Um, very, very visible, and I think that was well demonstrated on the previous case. Next slide, please. So, um, again, it's an open cell, self-expanding nitinol stent. What's uh, unique about this stent is that it has flared, flared ends, that uh, the flares are three millimeters in, uh, in length, and it makes the diameter uh, two millimeters wider than the rated diameter. It comes up to 16 centimeters in length, as we showed on the previous case and it comes up to 20 millimeters in diameter. Next slide, please. Um, the matrix, as you can see, the smaller diameters go through an eight French sheath, the 14 goes through a nine French sheath, and the larger sizes, 16, 18, and 20, go through a 10 French sheath. And um, as I'm sure everybody in the room is aware, this was the first FDA-approved um, device uh, for iliofemoral venous obstruction. Vici has come uh, to become on-label uh, subsequently. And so now we have two dedicated on-label implants. Next slide, please. Uh, so the trial that led to FDA approval was an international uh, trial. Uh, and again, this was uh, able to enroll patients with non-thrombotic disease, either acute or chronic uh, DVT in the iliofemoral segment, the primary uh, efficacy endpoint was 12-month primary patency. The safety uh, endpoint was freedom from major adverse events out to 30 days. Next slide, please. Um, the inclusion criteria uh, were fairly standard for a, a venous implant trial. The patient needed to be uh, SEEP classification three or greater, had symptomatic venous outflow obstruction, had a significant uh, narrowing as diagnosed by either duplex or intravascular ultrasound, and had to have a reference diameter between seven millimeters and 19 millimeters. Next slide, please. Uh, Mike Dake was the international uh, PI. Uh, 170 patients were enrolled, uh, again, across three different uh, continents, and all the results were independently adjudicated by the uh, Yale Venographic Core Lab and VASCOR for the uh, duplex follow-up. Uh, follow-up is ongoing out to three years. We have 12-month clinical data that is available for uh, review right now. Next slide, please. 
So here we have the primary safety endpoint. Obviously, with these devices, you want to make sure that the patients are not being harmed, as was uh, previously stated during the panel. This is a relatively younger substrate than a typical PVD patient. So the freedom from major adverse events was extraordinarily high, 94%. Uh, which was greater than the performance goal of 89%. Um, and the MAEs were target, uh, vas target vessel revascularization, um, uh, et cetera, as, you're, uh, listing uh, as are uh, listed here. So uh, there were slightly greater MAEs seen in the post-thrombotic cohort, which would be anticipated because it's a more complex lesion subset, um, and the non-thrombotic sub uh, subset had zero uh, MAEs after 30 days. Next slide, please. From a efficacy endpoint, the primary uh, patency at 12 months, and again, this was by uh, duplex, uh, by an independently adjudicated core lab, was 88%. This was far superior by the objective performance goal of 74%, which was pre-specified in the um, FDA trial design. When the endpoint was broken down as compared to the population studied, uh, the non-thrombotic lesions did far superior, as would be anticipated. There were 97% primary patency at 12 months as compared to 81% primary patency in the post-thrombotic uh, cohort. Uh, and again, you're going to see very, very divergent outcomes as more and more trials come online. Uh, we're going to see far superior outcomes in the non-thrombotic cohort with, return to, with respect to patency as compared to the post-thrombotic cohort. Next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, this is a uh, uh, sort of first uh, to reach FDA uh, approval, a dedicated uh, open cell nitinol stent that's undergone extensive uh, preclinical testing. The implant demonstrates high uh, radial resistive force and crush resistance. Uh, the safety endpoint was met with uh, freedom from MAEs at 30 days of almost 94%. The primary patency efficacy endpoint was met at 88% primary patency at 12 months. It was far superior to that 96% uh, in the non-thrombotic cohort at 12 months. Uh, TLR rate was incredibly low, just over 74, uh, 7, 7%. Uh, and again, this is really what, you are, what, what you're looking for in a dedicated uh, iliofemoral venous implant. Uh, of note, this implant had no stent fractures at 12 months. I think that's partially because of the high prevalence of the non-thrombotic cohort. So really, again, excellent data supporting this implant. Uh, and I, for one, welcome the fact that we have these dedicated devices on the marketplace. So if, uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna go to the history for the next case. And I, I think unfortunately we're gonna get this patient on the table once everybody breaks. So if we could go to the case presentation that I'm very curious to hear what the panel uh, would, would plan out for this very, very complex case. If we could switch over to the next slides. This is it, thank you very much. So next slide, please. Next slide. So, a 78-year-old uh, male with previous history of PE, upper GI bleeding, uh, early stage gastric cancer, DVT, got the IVC filter placed a year ago um, due to the pulmonary embolism and the uh, GI bleeding. And the patient had uh, a, what's presumed to be a curative resection of the gastric cancer. He has bilateral lower extremity swelling he can't ambulate, uh, literally ambulates with assistance. He had a diagnosis of iliofemoral venous obstruction in the setting of this IVC filter at an outside hospital, which was aborted, was not technically successful, then he was referred to my office hours. You can see the previous medical history here of note, he's got CAD and ischemic cardiomyopathy. Next slide. Uh, no known allergies, he's on therapeutic warfarin. Next slide. Uh, his vital signs are stable. His physical exam, aside from the extensive lower extremity pitting edema, was unremarkable. Next slide. Here's the CT scan. And you can see there's the filter. There's near atresia of bilateral illofemoral venous segments. There's a arteriovenous fistula in the left groin, probably from the outside hospital. And then obviously everything's patent all the way down here. And again, I'm just gonna go through that again. Of note, I, I think those of you that are sort of experts on reading CAT scans for IVC filters would note that this is not 
the temporary filter that we took out in the first case this morning. This is actually a, a, a permanent filter. It's a Greenfield filter. And next slide, please. Uh, and again, we have a chronic occlusion of bilateral iliofemoral segments up to the iliac vein confluence. So we have a 78-year-old male with an indwelling IVC filter. It's a green field with extensive chronic thrombosis now of the iliac vein confluence, bilateral iliac veins down to the common femoral veins with a likely AV fistula of the left common femoral artery to common femoral vein who has extensive bilateral symmetric pitting edema. And uh, obviously we have this, this, this plan here, but since I've got the, the you know, panel up on stage, I'm hoping that people can give me some pointers on how to set up this case. I'm gonna try and do it off camera and then hopefully show you in the morning what we did before we start the, the lecture. So I'm gonna, Keith, I'm gonna throw it back to you how would you tackle this? All right, so I think one good thing is that your common femoral veins are open. Um, Correct. I, I, right now, I'm less concerned about the AV fistula, so let's just put that aside and, and, and we'll worry about that maybe later, maybe not. I would uh, plan on getting bilateral common femoral vein um, or great saphenous vein access. I would get internal jugular vein access and I would kind of get all my accesses planned. Now, um, you know, right now, the whole idea is getting across the occlusion. It looks pretty co uh, chronic. Uh, the central common iliac veins are really, you know, minuscule. So I, I think you'll use your standard techniques in getting across those lesions. From a jugular perspective, I would also um, get access, as I said, as far as, you know, now we get to the whole idea of do you retrieve the filter, do you not retrieve the filter? You know, we, we know that people, and there's certainly a lot of, uh, we could talk about this as a separate topic, bravado of removing, you know, uh, permanent filters, certainly uh, quoted a lot on Twitter. But I think that, um, you know, the question is whether you really need to retrieve that filter. This goes back and forth. Certainly you're an expert. You'd want to have that in expert hands, whether or not you even consider doing that, or just jailed the filter and reconstructing. And, and I think the name of the game here is reconstructing the cava and bilateral common iliac veins. Uh, and I think that... Because you have open uh, femoral veins coming from below, you have a lot of good inflow, and especially on the left, which is going to help you, um, you know, with that small AB fistula. So that's kind of like my right. first step. So, so, so just to be a little bit more um, uh, binary in, in, a, in a question, would you err on taking out the filter or leaving it in? So I always air on taking out the filter, okay? Okay. I would want to see a venogram, a vena cavagram, only because, you know, I can't know right now is that, is the apex of that filter embedded in a chronic, like, occluded, stenotic vein where you're basically going to be, I mean, not that there's much lumen to deal with, but, you know, I always err on taking the filter out. But I, again, okay. I, 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 that's my preference, but... You know, some, I've seen a lot of damage done at places with taking the filter out when you could have just jailed it. All right. Does anybody else uh, that's with you now have any opinions about whether or not we should leave the filter in or, or take it out? And then just to throw it out there, do you have a, any particular preference on which stent you would use for such a long, chronically thrombosed segment? So, I, Rob, it's Kush. I would err on also taking the filter out for a couple of reasons. There's data um, from from Rain in Mississippi that when they published their results and they stented across the filter, their early reintervention rate was higher. If you look in their table, there was a like in the teens, there was a hot early reintervention right. rate. So. That's a very good point. The assumption being incomplete stent expansion. The second thing is retrieving this filter. It's an occluded cava, so not a whole lot of collateral damage concern in my mind, at least, uh, as long as you can get control of the apex. And then to your question about stents, um, you know, this is where I think these new on-label stents are gonna be great because not only are they long, and you can do an entire cable reconstruction like two to between two and four stents. Um, Correct. But you'll get uniform uh, diameter of each stent conduit, so to speak. Right. 
Those are excellent points. Do you, uh, do you have any kind of preference in the setting of a chronic occlusion, whether you prefer closed cell or open cell stents? You know, I think I would probably prefer a closed cell stent here, but that's just based on experience, certainly not on data. Um, I've done actually iliocable reconstructions with both current stent designs available, and I can tell you anecdotally the closed cell design gave you the round lumen. So if there is long-term validity to the aspect ratio argument, then certainly that might be something to think about when you're choosing your design. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to break off. I really appreciate your guys' comments. I think I've got a very good plan here. I'm going to let you guys, you know, talk a little bit more amongst yourselves about the different presentations you had before. Obviously, we're a little bit early, but if people want to break a little bit early for lunch, that's fine. And then I'll, I'll get the entire case presentation organized, and maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow during the filter retrieval session. Sound like a good plan? Sounds great. Thanks, Rob. Okay. All right. Thank you guys very, very much.